Hi, I'm Stephen Van Tassel. You're listening to Living the Wildlife, discussing all things related to vertebrate pest control as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. This is the disclaimer for Wildlife Control Consultant and Pest Geek Podcast for Living the Wildlife Podcast. Always follow national, state, provincial, and local laws when using pesticides and or other control methods to manage pests. Wildlife Control Consultant, LLC, Pest Geek Podcast, Living the Wildlife Podcast, Stephen M. Van Tassel, or their or his affiliates are not responsible for followers' use of the information provided here. Hi everyone, Stephen Van Tassel here, Wildlife Control Consultant, bringing you another episode of Living the Wildlife as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. Glad to have you on board. Do take a few moments, if you would, to subscribe to the channel, ring the bell so you can be notified of future of upcoming events as when they get posted. And then also, you can if you can give us a five-star review, that would be awesome as well. If you don't like to deal with YouTube, you can certainly get my podcast over on Rumble under Wildlife Control consultant if you have criticisms comments suggestions perhaps you'd like to be on a show maybe you have a product or service that you would like to highlight or maybe just a pet peeve that's driving you nuts we'd love love to have you on the show because part of our mission is to get information out to the wildlife control community and even if you're just a homeowner we're glad to have you on board as well if you want to learn about how to deal with wildlife control problems like a professional but our focus here is with professionals and we're glad to have you on board you can reach me at wildlife control consultant at gmail.com wildlife control consultant at gmail.com well today as you can see we have a guest we're glad to have mark Persitis, who is the owner of Wildman Mark Enterprises, LLC, based in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. But he also has a company called wildmanproducts.com. Check it out. He has some equipment there. He might, he might be gracious enough to talk about one of those items here today. But what we're really here to focus on, as at his request, is the Get Bent Academy, which is kind of a clever, a clever name there. Get Bent Academy. You can learn more at getbentacademy.com because it's a training event that deals with uh, metal bending in terms of repairs. And as you all, as you should know, if you don't know already, wildlife control. The money is in the repairs. It's not in the removal. The removal just gets your foot in the door. If you want to make real money in wildlife control. A lot of people can trap, but not everyone can make the repairs. He has a training event coming up in Houston, Texas, but I'll let him talk more about that. But before we do that, welcome aboard, Mark. We're glad to have you here. Tell us a little about your background and how you got into wildlife control. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I'm grateful for the opportunity. So long story short, I've been in the animal business since 1999. I used to work in the Philadelphia Zoo in my youth. I was uh, an animal handler and trainer. I work with animals like camels, elephants, horses, exotic birds, wallabies. That wow. kind of um, drove my passion with working with animals. And one of the things that I discovered once you get into working with animals is you kind of never get out. Uh, I There's like a huge network, and at least in my area, I speak to of people that work with animals that we kind of always run into each other mm. um from there I, I worked there for about seven years and from there i got into uh the philadelphia animal control i work for a, a company called paca philadelphia uh you know philadelphia animal care and control and as i worked with them i you know worked in the kennels worked with a lot of different animals and then got into the field as an animal control officer. And I did that for some years. And as I was doing uh, doing that, I got in, started getting into trapping some wildlife. They had me dealing with a lot of the wildlife calls because I was more familiar with exotic large animals and could handle mm. those situations. So immediately I got thrown into the deep end with the, with the wildlife. And the the name wild man came from one specific time because I got seven skunk calls in one day. Wow. And I was so, I I don't want to say angry, but I was a little upset when I came (laughs) back because three out of the seven skunks sprayed 
Mm. So I came into the building and the whole building smelled like skunk. And I had all the comments and everything. And I get into the front office and I had a few choice words for the dispatcher. <laughs> and when I when I was in a meeting, I kind of brought voice my opinion to everybody else because I was always getting stuck with the skunk jobs. Right, you know, right. one one smart alecky guy decided to come up and say, "Hey, well, you're the wild man, so you that's why you get all the wild jobs." That's clever. So yeah. that kind of that kind of stuck with me. I, I resented the name for a little bit, but eventually, you know, I learned to embrace it. But as I was in animal control, that's when I discovered the wild. Um, one of the game commission officers, because in Pennsylvania we have uh, we have game commission officers that oversee any type of uh, wildlife removal, okay. and they came in to do training session in animal control. And when they were talking to us about wildlife, kind of mentioned WCOs, and it made a you know light bulb oh, go off in my head when uh -huh. the guy was uh, talking about how these wildlife guys go out and pick up two raccoons and make like $500 in a few minutes for the same thing that we were doing for free. Mm. So I dove into my research and we ended up, my wife and I ended up, you know, looking more into the wildlife industry. And I started going in that direction and started my own business. Mm. Now, when I started wildlife control, because in animal control, you know, I went and did mostly emergency jobs right. and everything. Right. Got the traps, everything. Did did my little research, like, oh yeah, we're gonna do some one way doors and do this and do that and had some plans in the beginning on how we were gonna control the wildlife in Philadelphia and, you know, get into it. And as soon as we started getting into the, the wildlife work, that's when I realized I had no idea what type of world that I stepped into. Right. It was so much more complex and, you know, involved than what I had thought it was. So, you know, just kept learning and developing. Um, as the years went on, I transferred from being more of a trapping company to focusing on exclusion. Mm. To the point did now... Like, did you have like a carpentry background at all or are you just handy? Well, yeah and no. Okay. I'm I'm very handy because I when I was uh when I was young my father he was one of those guys who you know fixed everything he was a DIY guy plus he worked in like almost every single construction field and I used to help him a lot so I got the ex hands on experience doing a lot of stuff when I was younger you know passing him tools doing this and that right. and learning from uh learning from him but I never had an actual construction background. I did go to um, to Drums PA to a uh, a program of Job Corps, okay. and I was in I was in uh, Drums PA. I was uh, it's basically going going away. It's like a college for uh, it's like a you know trade school mm -hmm. more or less. And I was doing the um, carpentry training there, okay. so I did I did that for a few months. And the idea of my uh, my teacher over there was like, here's the tools, there's your equipment, and go and get it done. And so <laughs> so me and a group of my guys, we wound up doing a, a bunch of the siding and some metal work and everything on the buildings on campus okay. as a way to kind yeah. of save on on labor. They had the students take care sure. of the Oh, absolutely. Oh, free labor, campus. yeah. Yeah. We all wish we had free labor. <laughs> yeah. yeah, go go figure, right? Yeah, we, yeah. We we got left to our, our you know to doing that, so that's kind of where we where I I played around with doing some um some siding and everything. And when I got out of job for, I worked with a guy for a few months, doing um doing some metal capping on windows and some siding work and everything. And when I got into the the industry and I was doing the repairs kind of had a brain fart and forgot that I knew this skill. And it wasn't until I went to a training event and 
somebody else was teaching the method of metal fabrication for wildlife control. And I was like, Dang, man. I, I know this stuff. Right. Like yeah. I just had to get the equipment and start getting back into it. So that's what I did. And one of the, um, one of my main inspirations for doing the, uh, the hands-on training and getting into the metal fabrication is a guy from New York, uh, Bob Meekin. Mm-hmm. I met him at the um, at a New York uh, conference, okay. and he had a mock up that's kind of similar to mine oh, well, yeah. here, a yep. little, little mini mock up with yep. soffit returns on there, and he did some demos for uh, for soft returns, and he also did some demos for uh, various areas on his mock up to show like what's the best way to utilize metal for exclusion purposes Mm. and that kind of just like that that set me in a direction that i needed to because from there i just invested 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 um more tools towards uh metal fabrication repairs so we can offer our clients you know a, a better service yeah so you've been doing so you've been doing that for a period of time what five six years probably at this point yeah about I got to be like six years now. Six I think years. It, that conference it was about in uh, 2018. Okay, so the so now you've transitioned over into offering the training for other people. What was uh, that's a big step, right? So you know, sometimes people are like, "No, I don't. I don't want to train my competition." So what what was the driving force for you to do that? Because that you know, it's a lot of time. It's a lot of investment because you're doing a hands-on event is what I understand, a two-day yeah. event here in February. So talk a little about how your, you know, your vision for your Get Bent Academy uh, and what this training event is going to be, how, how that came about. Well, I did have that, that caution, you, should, you would say, about training my competition. Right. And I can't say that I don't still feel that in, in a way. And I, you know, cause I'm going to be doing it locally and I know that eventually I'm going to have some of my uh, competitors walk through the door. Right. But at the end of the day, in this industry, I feel as though it's better to have more people on your team than think of them as competitors. When it comes to it, I actually had a, uh, person that took one of my classes from York PA. I mean, he's not too far. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily consider that like our service areas don't cross or anything else like that. But, you know, he is close enough to me that he would be considered competition. Mm. And he was one of my students and he actually called me up and had uh, questions about this large job that he was trying to do. And before I never would dream of it, uh, doing anything like this, but I told him, I said, hey, we'll work together. We'll get it done. And I jumped in on the job with him. We both made a profit off of there. And it wound up being a really good, uh, good fun job to, to get done. Yeah. And at, at the end of the day, I had to kind of humble myself and realize that it's not as much about, you know, who's my competition. It's we're we're in a niche industry mm. that we should all be helping each other so we can elevate the industry right. and kind of set that, that standard. Yeah. Cause even though we have all this training available and everything, there's a lot of people that they'll get part of the picture and they'll attempt at doing these, these metal repairs and everything else like that. But seeing things on a slide or seeing things, you know, like, Hey, let's, bend this together, slap it together real quick, and I'll show you how to get it done. That doesn't necessarily translate from you seeing it one time to going out in the field and being able to do it by yourself, especially if you're not handy with tools. Um, I've noticed a lot of people in this industry, they're not like myself and a select few that come in with a partial construction background or anything else like that. They get into the wildlife industry and then when they get thrown into the deep end, they're like, wait a minute, we got to do repairs. We got to do this and that. Like, as far as I see it, we're not, 
I don't see myself as a WCF. I see myself as, you know, a problem solver. And my clients have problems with their roofing. They have problems with their siding. They have problems with, you know, uh, the the cleanliness of their of their their attic when it comes to you know having to do attic remediations they have all these problems that that we have to to solve and it takes an array of skills to be able to be a wildlife control operator it's not just like hey I know about animals I can spit you facts about animals and tell you you know when when they're born how how many are born and tell you all the the scientific knowledge about it, which, by the way, I'm not that great at. <laughs> I'm I'm good at the repairs. I'm sure. good at the the solving the problems. You sit there, you get me, you know, into the nitty gritty about talking about you know the biology of the animals and everything else like that. Yeah. Uh, I'm not that good with memorizing facts. You show me the show me the house. I'll figure out the problem and I'll get them out. <laughs> right, right. I'll, I'll get it done in the fastest, quickest way possible sure. and give you some beautiful repair work. Yeah. And that's kind of where, where, where my niche is. My goal in my company is to solve the wildlife problems without having to touch the wildlife. Okay. That's so why I do. So your business is moving toward an exclusion model as opposed to a trap and remove model. Yeah, we've One we've done doors. that. For, yeah, we've done that for years now. Wow. I mean, I made a I made a full tilt once I learned about the exclusion methods because Amazing. we did it. We did we do a lot of row homes in Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. Um, we deal with a large variety of properties. I mean. Every, everything from colonial houses, row homes, twins, Victorians, yeah. like different types of uh, substrates on the roof. Like you name it, we've got it in this area because I right. don't only service Philadelphia. I service uh, the three surrounding counties mm-hmm. and we've got a few million within our immediate service area and the area that we can service and that we get to i'm we're close to like 10 million people around here yeah and because you have so many different structures it's such an old area too you're dealing with different types of construction over the hundreds of year over the generations i mean you have you know balloon construction you've got that colonial construction that victorian how the designs are it's hard for people in the west to really process the diversity of of buildings you have to struggle with on the East coast, especially in those oh, yeah. older regions, you know, like Boston and New England and, you know, Philadelphia, of course, was, you know, used to be the capital of the country, but I mean, it's an old area. So yeah, I, wow. Okay. Yeah. We can go from, you know, dealing with the house cover uh, with, with siding and, you know, your, your traditional build a house where they plant a seed and get a whole County in you know, a few weeks to old red brick, homes then to you know cobblestone and then to houses that are made with slate and yeah. we've, we've got everything in between and it, it just kind of when we got into the exclusion work and starting to do that it just forced us to uh to kind of develop our skills and learn how to deal with the different substrates and the different uh problems that are associated with them mm. and it just uh I've had some people that have come to me from other companies and they say, we got this, no problem. And then when they get here and they see how many different structures <laughs> that, that we deal with and how much they learn. And the guy nearly lost his mind. He was like, I thought you were exaggerating, but this is, <laughs> this is insane. Right. So the, uh, that that is something that's just so important. I just want to put a caveat out for our for our listeners. Make sure before you start doing some of the repairs, some states are kind of picky about what you're allowed to do with a structure. Make sure you're following your local uh, building code laws if you need to get a contractor's license or something like that. My understanding is California, and I'm not in California is a 
crazy place. But uh, California, if you're doing repairs on a building that costs $500 or more, you have to have a contractor's license and you may need a building permit even to do some of these repairs. But nevertheless, make sure you're following the law in your particular area uh where, wherever you live in our in our podcast world so i just want to put that caveat out there so let's talk about your the training event that you have coming up in in february the get bent academy and you can learn more about this at the get bent academy.com for those of you listening uh so it's a two-day event is my understanding so i uh, tell, tell yeah. me about what's what would someone learn if they come down to uh it's going to be in houston texas at the houston elk lodge uh, February 3rd and 4th, 2024, and February 10th and 11th, 2024, because you're having two events, two training yeah. events. They're both two-day events. So yeah. this is going to be some serious training here, folks. So, yeah, describe that for our audience. Yeah, so the, the training's a bit intense, because in comparison to some of the other uh, training courses that are out there pertaining to our industry, you spend a lot of classroom time. Our classroom time is at an absolute minimum i will you'll probably be sitting down in classroom time about an hour and a half a day tops wow all the rest is hands-on um now while you're in the classroom time we dive into various different topics like we talk about the tools the materials we also get into talking about some of the structures and do's and don'ts on what you're looking at at the structures when it comes to uh, metal fabrication. We get into certain things and, and we really dive into this as far as water damming when you're installing uh, metal. If you do not install metal properly, you can cause more problems than you want to handle. I mean, mm. if you seal the wrong place, if you put the, the metal layered in the wrong direction, then you're going to get water intrusion and it's going to cause uh, problems for your client and problems for your company. Right. Because um, last thing you want is to do a simple metal repair that, you know, you charge $300 for and then cost your client $10,000 worth of damage. Right. Yeah, that would be bad. Right. So knowing, knowing when and where to use metal and how to install it is, is crucial. And that's what, what we focus on in the um in the class bending a piece of metal is easy i can show you how i i got a couple pieces right here okay. for for the mock-up like anybody can take a break and bend a few pieces of metal but if you don't install them properly then you start to cause problems now as far as um you know the the water damming and everything like that that's gets into your uh, your fasteners, how you install your fasteners, making sure you're using the right, correct fasteners in the right uh, in the right places. Uh, we get into placement of it. And we even get into sealants and where, when, and what sealants that you should be using for what, uh, what structure. Mm -hmm. Now, um, we do have a limited time to sit there and work on that because... Yeah. Everybody wants to get to the hands-on. Sure. That's that's where it, it, it gets into, you know, that's where the fun part is. The fun yeah. part is getting your hands on the tools, getting your hands on the brakes, and getting up and doing installs. Now, this isn't your run-of-the-mill training where you're going to have a bunch of guys standing up in front of you, bending the metal and saying, here, this is how you do this, this is how you do that, and everybody's standing there taking notes. No, right. be Put the metal in your hands. We wow. put the tools in your hands and we have you do the actual work. While you have trained professionals there that will help and guide you along the way. So you can make the mistakes in our workshop rather than on a client's house. Mm. And that that's where the, the key in the training comes is to be able to have that, uh, that kind of shadow there with the instructor that can stop you when you're going to make a, a mistake or create a bad habit right. when you're doing the metal fabrication so that this way you can not only learn the right way to do it, but you're developing your, your skills with the, with the professional right there. So you're I driving, 
So you're driving, sorry. Uh, so you're driving down all of your equipment to Houston in what, probably a trailer or a, and, and then having that set up. So you have what groups of two probably working together with maybe one instructor for every six or eight people walking around and making sure everyone's doing their thing. Does that sound about right? Because that's not be exactly. Incredible. It's a. Yeah. It was a logistical nightmare at first because yes, I was. <laughs> yeah, that you... was the original plan. Yeah, the original plan was we were going to load up everything on a oh U-Haul. My... Right. Uh, there, there goes my time clock. It's lunchtime. <laughs> but we were going to load up everything on a forty-foot U-Haul. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm saying forty foot, a twenty-six foot long U-Haul. Sure. And we stack all the equipment in there and drive it down to Houston, which from Pennsylvania was going to be like two days of drive. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah. And it's like going to Montana. It was, yeah, it was it was a nightmare. So um, I, I had to adjust my plans. So what we're doing now <laughs> is we're doing pods. OK, so we're doing pods and yeah. storage pods and getting them delivered. So wow. in a couple, couple weeks from now, I'm getting pods dropped off to my shop and we're going to load up load them up and they're going to be delivered over to Houston to a, a local operator who uh, agreed to receive the, the equipment. So it, it's going to sit over there for a couple weeks and we're going to, you know, then transfer it with the truck it. over to the lot. Wow. Yeah. That's a, that's a great idea. It certainly saves a lot of headache on, on your side. Because there, you know, you could always have a breakdown. There could be an accident. I mean, that could. Now you're able to just sort of hop on the plane and and go down there and save you some time. But, but that's still logistically a major uh, a major event to have that level of equipment, so that each individual is able to get access to. The, that's uh, wow. That's uh, that that's amazing. And so they're able to do this over two days. And so what are some of the techniques that they would be learning uh over those two days like we have a you have a return a soffit return there you have in their background i'm assuming they'll learn how to do that all right so uh, so bear bear with me here because mm -hmm. i'm i am going to have to turn this around so as as you can see with this little uh mock building the way yeah. we designed it is we have a soffit return here yeah, yeah. And we're going to teach three different ways to do the soffit return. We okay. do a two-piece vertical face soffit return, one piece, and then we're going to do the V style. The okay. V style is the easiest one and most uh, most common that people mm -hmm. use. Right. But we we get into the three different uh, three different styles. Um, I have this one here that has siding on it. Yep. We're going to have a few of them for more of the advanced uh, students that come in that might have um, some fake stone on there or another challenge where they'll have to scribe the soffit just to kind of give them a, a little bit more depth in their training because mm. we get people that come in at all different levels. And then we have our gable return here yep. that we're going to be doing uh, repairs on. And on the back of this one, if we turn this around here, we have our. Oh, look at that! That's clever. So, so this is where we're going to do the install. This is our uh, mock shutter right here. Sure. And yeah. we're going to do the, uh, the siding. And then people that feel more comfortable will be able to do the stone. The stone and work. Kind of nice. get some practice. And get some practice in on their scribing. So is that going to be for like excluding, you know, bats from getting behind a shutter or mice getting entrance into that building that way? Or so you can metal to sort of finish that off? Yeah. I mean, okay. typically what we deal with in our area is bats getting behind, behind the shutters, birds, yeah. you know, okay. like starlings, rat bulls, uh, you know, things, things of that nature. But scribing can be utilized in many different areas. You have uh, some stone structures where the fascia board or the crown molding at the bottom will have large gaps there, and you may have to do scribing on the underside to keep for rodent entry. I mean, 
scribing is one of the one of the skills that you could use in various areas right. when you're doing right. exclusion work. Yeah. It sure beats when you you know, going into large gaps and just filling it with a bunch of excluder fill or expansion foam and kind of bridging that gap there. Right. Yeah. It makes I, it it makes for a much neater, cleaner repair when it comes down to uh doing exclusion work. Yeah. And the clients will never know the difference between your work and what was originally on the house if you yeah. do it right. Right. No, it's it's amazing the blending that, you know, I've, I look at some pictures on, you know, Facebook guys putting up some of their work and some of it's truly a beautiful thing to behold. It's like, wow, that was gorgeous. Yeah, you know, not everyone's able to get to that level, of course, but I do like when you said that, you know, you're by providing this training, you're, you're lifting the entire industry up. And I, you know, in and yeah, that there's going to be competition. But now if you're competing with, with someone who has your same skill level, you're not going to be driving down the price. Exactly. So that's one advantage out of this. And I like the fact that you talked about that you could collaborate with a competitor for those big jobs because labor is such a huge problem in the industry. And so now you're able to say, you know, yeah, the guy's a competitor, but we're not enemies. We can bid on these big jobs. Otherwise, you're going to get the national chains probably swooping in and doing some of this work and then squeezing out the local guys, so to speak. But that's, does that make, does that sound about right? Yeah, that sounds about right. And there's not many wildlife companies out there that they have a whole lot of technicians. Right. Anyway, yeah. I mean, you've got some of the quote unquote larger wildlife companies. They'll have about 10 trucks out there. Yeah. And that's, that's, That's what big. we look at as far as, you know, large wildlife control yeah. companies in comparison to like some of these pest control companies that they might be running, you know, 30 or 40 trucks right. out there getting this, uh, getting the work done. Yeah. But most of the, most of the guys, at least that I know in the wildlife industry, if you got four trucks out there, you're doing pretty well for yourself. And a lot of people are, are solo operators. So as as far as at least at least in my area, guys that are quote unquote uh, larger companies, the reason why they're larger companies is because they offer pest control as well. And most of those companies, their their primary focus is on the, the pest control yeah. and yeah. you know the recurring business. Yeah. Which um, my myself, I work with a few of these companies and I get referred jobs from them all the time. I've even had some of the uh, I've worked for some of the larger companies where they don't deal with certain wildlife work and they're sending it to me and I just get put in right on their bill. Sure. And yep. it works. It works out for me because they do certain things. I don't step on their toes, but they call me out for all the metal fabrication. They call me out for the, the detailed work and they they pay me accordingly. Yeah. And it's just like any any other other client, they're asking me for a service and I, I take care of it. I don't look at it as much as the 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 competition anymore because I offer a skill set that a lot of other companies don't do in my area. Yeah. So I can just tell you that having used back in the day, I'm showing my age here a little bit, but uh, some of us would use, you know, wire mesh to try to close holes. And if we used aluminum flashing, it was uh, not put on in a very pretty way. I can assure you, I didn't have a metal bender. Uh, it is so much better for the client uh, to, to make it look nice and you can charge a, a better premium on it than when, when I was, doing it back in the early years of the industry so yeah the, this training so it's a two-day event in houston tech houston texas february 3rd and 4th february 10th and 11th you pick which event you want to go how much room how much room do you have left uh in in your training event here uh, just to kind of give people a sense that you know don't let this opportunity go by, I guess, if they're in the area or they want to fly down to Houston. Well, because of how uh, intense the, the training is, and we want to make sure that we get provide our students with that that one on one atmosphere, mm -hmm. uh, we keep it uh, limited numbers. Mm -hmm. So 
that's why I'm doing two two classes because I know this isn't like it's it's a high demand class right now. Right. So we're doing only about thirty students per class. Oof, so right. far, we're we're about halfway full between the the, the two, two classes. classes. Okay. So we we do this because when I give assign an instructor, I'm assigning. Each team has a break, has a set of tools, and has one of these, um, one of each of these mockups wow. to sit there and and work on. And I'm assigning one instructor to five teams. So okay. for every ten people, they're getting an instructor that's dedicated to them for that specific skill. And we're going to kind of rotate through there so everybody can kind of get everybody gets enough time that they need to practice the skill, develop the skill and perfect the skill before we move on to, um, to the next area. Right. So, so you have little station, you have stations and then the, you move the teams to the various stations and they work their right. way around. Yeah. Oh, okay. So like, just, just for example, on day one, this is our day one mock-up here. Okay. So this on this side represents what uh, a rodent entry would be at the bottom of a garage door. Oh, all right. There's there's actually a, a gap. I have that um that covered right now. I was working okay. on some videos with it. And then we have a corner post. Corner post. Where, yeah. <laughs> where the uh you know rodents love to climb up this OSB and then sure. chew chew out the corner and make their right. way in there. Yeah. So we make our own type of corner cap that goes in there. Okay. And also, we're gonna have um, we're gonna work on a cover for the the corner post so that when you run into those situations where the corner post is just busted because of you know maybe the landscaper or you know somebody hit it in cold because mm -hmm. you know this this final siding you smack that in cold it just breaks apart like right, glass. Right, right. So, so we're one team is going to be working on this section of the mock-up whereas the next team will be working on this kind of soffit area yeah where we're going to do the bottom end of the soffit and it's got some obstacles here that you got to get around get around and then no we're going to do a fascia board cover and a drip edge and nice. when we do this we're not only working on you know just covering it yeah. but if you can see here how oh, I got this yep. piece kind of prefab. I already got you're working on where to put your notches, where to fold to wrap around the corner, nice. and kind of installing it so that it fits right in the place. Blush right there. And we're going to work on. Do you use an adhesive behind that or do you screw that into place? We fasten them into okay. place. Fast. You can you can use adhesives in certain situations. Okay. Um, I'm actually working with a screw scoop to develop a smaller uh, screw that looks more like a rivet rather than the traditional uh, truss oh. screws that are used in the industry. Okay. So this this right here yeah, is uh, yeah, that's a a pan head screw or truss screw, however you call it. I right. call them, um, you know, the truss screw. So basically, in the industry, you've got a lot of guys that are using these uh, these truss screws, whereas okay. the screws, uh, you probably can't see it here. <clears throat> Bring this a little closer. So this screw right there, okay, that's one what? of the um, one of the screws that we're uh, developing. All right, we actually. Um, we actually got well i got the idea from um from menards menard sells these types of screws oh really but they're in, okay so they're insanely expensive and they're not available in my area so they getting them they can't ship them to your area yeah they they can they can ship them but obviously paying for they're shipping paying for and all shipping. all that gotcha. stuff okay yeah wow. so we wound up the developing with uh with screw scoop a similar screw that's got different specs that meets uh meets what my needs are they're going to be about three quarters of an inch 
They have mm. the, the same type of head with the um for a T15 torque bit. Nice. And it's nearly invisible from the ground. Wow. So the other ones, the other ones, while they look great and they blend in and everything like that, these ones are going to look even better because they're no larger than the size of a rib uh, yeah. of a rivet. So you have such a lower profile. You don't have that head stick it out as much. Yeah, exactly. Very nice. Because it, yeah. The thing that I hate about metal work, and I, I got to be honest with you, I get a little picky about it sometimes. Okay. Is when people go and install it and then they put a ton of screws or they put this big old okie doke screw that you can see from space. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. And it, okay. It, it messes, it messes with the whole look of, of what you're trying yeah. to, uh, to achieve. The details so, matter. The details right. matter. Right. <laughs> as, I get it. You, <laughs> yeah. And in my company, we try to make sure that we don't, allow our work to look like repairs right we right we want it to look like it belongs on the house right and the the devil's in the details making sure that things are are painted uh you know to match the the screws are installed properly that you're not putting big old lines of caulk that you know look like they're they're uh just some like some clear worms crawling across the edge but we try to sit there and focus on all these little details wow. and in the wow. class so that this way our students are providing their clients with the most professional work possible. Okay. So I'm looking at some of the work you have back there. It must have been a, a few hundred hours probably to put those mock-ups together. Yeah. Uh, just, so, just to build them. I mean, at the, not even talking about buying the materials, just to cut the material, screw them together, adhere, adhere them. Wow. Okay. Yeah, so so this this mock-up here, we actually had, when we did our first class, we had a much larger version. Yeah. And it was... Hard to like, move. <laughs> yeah. And it was... We had, we had eight of them, and the idea was to have a couple students working on them on either side. And it used a lot more metal, and they were a nightmare to yeah. transport. So we miniaturized the sign, and that's where we got uh, where we got this. This one is new. Okay. This one we had. Uh, I had changed the hands-on portion of the class because before we had exercises for uh, different bends and everything, kind of to teach people how to manipulate the metal in certain directions to get people used to using the mm. brake and an exercise to get them thinking. Not not as much thinking like, oh, how do I bend this specific piece? Because right. and the name of the game is custom. Right. You're not going to get one specific piece all the time. You're going to have to uh, adjust it. So the idea of the exercises was to uh, teach people how to think when it comes to manipulating the metal. Whereas now we built this new mock-up where it's going to be the the same thing. It's going to teach you how to think, but the challenges are on the installs, not as much with the uh with the metal work itself and bending the metal because at the top here we have uh, a soffit that has a few obstacles because it's got that, yeah. that bump it doesn't out. show in the it doesn't show in the camera you might have to oh. move the camera up a little bit to see to see the top oh there you go oh wow yeah. all right so it's got a little bit more depth here yeah. so this one the idea with this piece is we're going to have them do two pieces we're going to have them install a piece at the bottom on underside of soft but that lip is going to come down and over the underside of this fascia right. and then we're going to have another piece that comes down and wraps completely and oh kind of layers it wow. like we were uh like we we're talking about doing proper layering yeah. because when you're doing uh metal if you start from the top to the bottom then you create these creases that leave an opportunity for water intrusion for water to get in yep so we talk about this in, in the in the class 
but actually going and using a building like this where we're doing multiple pieces will really drive the point home mm. to the students so that they can see what I mean and why it's so important to install the metal in a in a certain direction. Way. Yeah. I would just add, you know, it also helps that when you're getting into repairs, folks, it's probably always a good idea to take photos before you start your repairs and then take photos after your repair is done and then store those uh store those photos away in case something happens. I mean, talk to your insurance agent. That could be a whole different world. But yeah, this because sometimes you'll get accused of things that you never did. <laughs> so, oh yeah. Um because they know you got good. insurance. <laughs> Yeah. And yeah. it's also good for a brag book. Yeah, absolutely. Too. Right. For brag because purposes you, too. But that's the positive yeah. side. <laughs> that's uh, yeah, that's excellent. The, because the thing about doing the uh you know, the repair work sometimes when you're doing I, I realize that when you're doing really good repair work and your clients can't see it, yeah, and then they come out and they look and they say, Well, Where what did you do? What did you do? Right. Yeah, and that's awesome. if you don't have that before and after picture, then it takes a little bit of explaining. I I I made the mistake once or twice where I had to go up there with the uh with binoculars and give my binoculars to the client and say, "Look right there, you see where those screws are placed, and that that little piece of metal right there. That's what we did. Oh, okay, right. I see it yeah. now. Right, right, yeah." Yeah, that's important. Is, so you you're so you're doing so it's a two day event. So d these are eight hour days. I'm assuming two full eight hour days, or is it a day and a half? Yeah, we go. I mean, honestly, it's it's designed to be an eight hour day. Okay, but my instructors and myself were dedicated to yeah. our students when it comes there. We go overtime okay. if needed. If um. In the event, we have some students, and it, it will happen that they come in and they're completely green. They don't know, you know, they never picked up a pair of snips before to, to cut any metal. They're like, this is the first time them using a break. Mm -hmm. And we offer to come in the next day early, and we'll sit there. We'll work with people one-on-one -on -one and kind of give them the extra attention that they that they need. I mean, it's it's up to the, to the student. I'm... For those two days, when I do get Ben Academy, I lock it. I'm not doing anything else. Right. If right. they if they want to sit there and stay till seven o'clock after the fact, then we keep working and um, working on uh, different areas to kind of perfect techniques. I'll do it. Most people won't do that right. because by the end of our class, they are beat. Yeah, tired. Yeah, it's going to be a lot. So those are long. Those are long days to be sure. So, what is it? Uh, can we cover cost, or is that uh, that a problem? Yeah. Cost. So for the two days. So just a reminder to everyone: February third and fourth, twenty twenty four, in Houston, Texas, at the Houston Elk Lodge. Additional details on the getbentacademy dot com. That's get to g e t bent b e n t academy just like the school academy.com get bent academy.com february 3rd and 4th and february 10th and 11th two different events because it's a two-day event so uh what does that cost so for per student it's 900 dollars. okay and that covers the the two days the the meals for today we have you know light breakfast there we serve lunch so you don't have to worry about going anywhere getting anything to eat we get get you covered. We keep you, you know, fueled up to make it through the day. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, if you're sending multiple students, I do have a breakdown on the oh, pricing. Okay. So if I, I have uh, one company that he's, you know, sending six of his technicians there, and I'll give you a break on the pricing. That's right. But, oh. but okay. basically, if you're coming to the class and you're bringing multiple students, just give me a call. Pretty much after uh, three students, uh, that's when I'll start to do uh, a breakdown on the pricing. Okay. Now, as as far as, um, you know, the uh, availability, if you want to sign up for the class, you can either go to my website at getbentacademy.com and there's links on the events page. 
and you can either you can either sign up for the class through uh through that website or you can go to wildmanproducts.com and on the featured products you'll see the the GBA logo that's mm-hmm. there and you select the date and sign up for the the class there so pretty much registering you go onto the website you pay for it i'll get your email your name and all that and then coming up closer to the class that's when i reach out to everybody and i send out the registration form with the waivers and all that because obviously we're working with with tools we need to make sure that our students you know sign the waiver that they understand that we are working with uh sharp objects or work metal we're working with things that that can hurt you yeah and if you're not if you don't follow uh you know fill out the registration form we get you uh to do it at the door because you know we don't one we don't want anybody getting hurt two right. we want to make sure that everybody understands the risk that comes along with doing the hands-on work yeah. and um we provide goggles for everybody we provide gloves oh to goodness. make sure that people you know kind of stay safe because yeah. otherwise you end up with scars all over your hands like me <laughs> Okay. Well, we certainly don't certainly don't want that. So yeah, just a reminder to everyone, it's like, yeah, it may sound like for some of you, the $900 may sound like a lot, but when you look at what you could potentially earn charging your clients to provide this additional service, uh, it is it is not that expensive. Uh, when, you, when you think about it, plus, you know, you could make a trip to Houston, talk to your tax accountant probably would be a tax deductible trip because you're doing it for business work and training so definitely talk with him about that i'm not a tax attorney i'm not an accountant but uh so just but those are things that certainly are standard within the industry so uh two days at eight at 16 hours that is uh from you're getting hands-on training that is that is an amazing an amazing thing uh so anything else that you wanted to add did you want to show uh you had a little demonstration piece i believe you mentioned earlier uh to me that you did you want to take some time and show them how you how you do that you pop that little cover on the bottom or uh did we want to or are you comfortable for us to finish up yeah i'm yeah, I'm I'm good with it. So okay. I already got this uh this piece kind of pre-cut so we can mm-hmm. save yeah. a little bit of time. Sure. So with the corner cap, this is a, a common issue. I if you're going into uh in the field and you see siding on the house, this is an easy upsell <laughs> to, to get those to get those done. And they're pretty simple to do. It's funny so how they dem- always forget to do them. You know, it's the contractors always forget to, to put that extra piece on. <laughs> oh, no, no. They don't forget. They just don't do it. They just don't do it. <laughs> You're being if kind. It, I'm being too kind. <laughs> there, so there, there's a there's a select group of individuals that actually make sure they do siding properly. But most yeah. most guys that are out in the field, you know, they're just, just you know, doing it. Mm-hmm. They're, they're just – Get it done. Looks good for my house, and keep it moving to the next shop. Because time shop, is you know? always an issue. Yeah. If it wasn't for guys like that, we wouldn't be in, uh, wouldn't be in, in business. business. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, okay. true enough. So here, let me try kind yep, of. going to angle that down a little bit. Okay. So, I had already measured out this piece, obviously. Yeah. Okay. So we're working with a with a three inch piece here. Okay. And using a malco folding tool here okay on this side is one inch so i'm going to bend it up here for one inch and then i'm putting the pressure on the table so it holds it nice and firm and i'm bending that up and i just simply do two 90s right there little channel yep now let me get my my speed square here now I'm going to measure one inch because we're going to kind of close it off and box it. And as I said before, I already know the measurement of my uh, little corner post right there. Mm-hmm. So I'm putting a mark at two and one eighth of an inch. And then again at two and one eighth. 
Oh, and just a little side note here. A lot of people in the, not only in the wildlife industry, but in the contracting industry, people don't know how to read a tape measure. Yes, that is a problem. So that's one of the things that we teach too. We teach you how to use a speed square, the many purposes of using a speed square, how to get certain measurements, as well as reading and using tape measures, which is crucial for when you're teaching new employees. Yes. Was it measure twice, cut once? Is that the the rule? (laughs) Yeah, that's that's the rule. That's the rule. Does everyone follow it? No. (laughs) (laughs) No, but uh, but it's good advice. You know, just just to make sure. So I'm I'm just drawing my lines here with my speed yeah. square. Okay. And I'm gonna kind of take it around so I can get it to the other side. And then I'll show you what we're gonna do from there. All right. So and a lot of people, one of the things that we run into especially when it comes to reading tape measure you'll you'll hear the the term two and two ticks or something like that because oh, they don't okay. know the actual fraction right. that does not fly and get Ben academy okay. we will make you you know learn what the fractions are on your tape measures because that's right. going to be important when you're doing detailed work if it's off by an eighth of an inch, you can create some some nasty little bevels or uh, create dents in your metal when you're fastening it and then cause oil can. So what I did here okay. um, is I just did two relief cuts Yeah, because I'm going to bend this part off. This is my excess here. Okay. And that kind of just folds off. And now we got our, our three lines. All right. right. Yeah. This was our, our our one inch, our one inch, and then these in between these two spaces is um two and one eighth. Two and one eighth. Okay. Now, I'm not cutting a straight line because I'm gonna be folding it. All right. I'm kind of cutting out triangles here. Oh. So that when it folds the metal doesn't get in the way of it. Right. You're, you're cutting off that excess so it doesn't jam things up. Exactly. Okay. So it kind of uh, looks like, like little little triangles that I'm cutting out here. And flipping it over and repeating the process on the other side. And these these little relief cuts, having the the lines straight around, it makes it a lot more convenient when you have that guide there to make sure that your relief cuts are lined up perfectly, so you don't get a crooked piece here, because you're trying to make it as symmetrical as possible. So what you end up with is this. Okay. And on this side, you don't need any hand uh, hand bending tools. You just do it with your hand yep. and flex it okay. and fold that little box in there. Yep. And then I'm flexing this out and then fold this little box in here, kind of fold it together. Yep. Oh. And here, let's see. Make sure that's inside there so it's uniform. And now we're at this point where you just flex it and you got this little square. Well, this little part of a uh, part of a square. And when you take this little L piece. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. Just might want to pull the uh, camera up just slightly. Let's see. Yep. Yep. And then just angle, there you go. Perfect. Yeah, right. That's perfect. So, and then you got your corner post and you're kind of going to push it out. Yeah. And flex it in there. Yeah. 
and it fits in nice and tight. So do and you put do you put uh, some adhesive on there, or do you just simply screw it in place? No, see, you can put adhesive in there, but I don't advise it. I don't advise that you do. If you're going to put adhesive, I would put adhesive on the back end so it just touches the end of the corner post because just in case the the siding uh, installer did something improperly and the water is flowing gotcha. behind there, you don't want the, to to create a little uh, trap right here and gotcha. have the water start to damming because then it's going to rot out that whole corner right. yeah. of the building. Nice. So you don't put any adhesive on the back end. You want to make sure that it's got a way to flow. Now there is a product called a uh, pest block as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. He's oh, uh, Will Langman's one of our sponsors at get Ben Academy. Mm -hmm. And he sells a perforated metal that are perfect for uh, these type of situations. Cause you're not going to see it. And uh, with the perf metal, if there is any type of situation with, uh, with water intrusion, it's going to drip right out. Plus, oh. it's small enough that it's bee hole tight and um, rodents aren't. Right, right. Nice. So, what I what I do is I'll take I'll take a screw, my okay. my truss screw, like an inch and a half. Yeah. And then Just kind of it pilot place. it through there. And you're done. And huh? once I get it in there, pilot it in on the other side. And now that piece is in there, solid. solid as a rock. Wow, yeah. And that took that would have taken you now start to finish because you obviously did some pre work before the video to kind of keep it from getting clunky. Start to finish, how long would that have taken you to to do? Uh, Forty five minutes, half an hour for for that one. Yeah. No, I I did it slow for the sake of the the camera. Sure. Once you once you get into it. I can rip them out in about 10 minutes, 10 minutes. So you'd and charge what? 25, $30 a piece, $50 a piece. Yeah. We tried $35 for our end cats. Yeah. Okay. And you know, think about how many corners are in the house. Oh yeah. At least four. Yeah. And you sit there, you, you, you create those, those little end caps right there. And all I, all I needed was, you know, a measuring tool, my um, hand folding tool and a pair of snips. A pair of snips. And yeah. you could just sit there and make them in your shop too. If yeah. you're if you're on a rain day and you got nothing else better to do for your technicians or even for yourself and you want to make a few, these these corner posts are pretty standard. Mm. They they're not coming in all these uh, different sizes. So as right. long as you right. know the the size of your corner post, generally what you're going to be working with. You can prefab those in your shop prefab. and sit there and mess with a uh, mess with uh, your your tools for about an hour. Yeah, and by the time you're done, you you got got it like a second nature, and you can rip these things out in like five minutes. That's amazing. Yeah, there, you can just see the level of how the metal work really allows another level of income and also service to your client and preventing and also preventing wildlife problems um in in the future and so this is really the way to go folks i can't uh i wish this was training was around when i was in business back in the day so uh, <laughs> but the industry has clearly yeah. changed <laughs> me too in, in a good way in a good way uh than what it was and back when i was doing it in the uh, late 80s and early 90s so uh without a doubt uh so let's Let's uh, just sort of cap up. Anything that we need to talk about that we haven't discussed that you wish we should? We've had um, you for about we've had you for over an hour now, so I want to make sure we're gracious with your time. Uh, is there anything we've missed that you want to well, make sure we discuss? Just just real quick. I mean, just want to get into you know the the wild man products. I won't uh, keep yeah. you guys here for too much longer. Sure. No, no. Okay, so, that'd be um, good. So I. I will be at the, the Wildlife Expo coming up okay. this year. I'm going to have a booth there. And at the, the expo, I'm going to be doing a session on one-way doors. And obviously, one of the features that I'm having there is my one-way doors. So we developed the uh, eviction door back in 2019, I want to say, is when we released it. And this is 
this is basically built off of the concept of being, you know, a one-way door that you can install just about anywhere. Now, um, here's the 4x4 eviction okay. door. Yeah. It, it's obviously been modified quite a few times for, you know, space and efficiency. But basically, with this one-way door in comparison to the other one-way doors on the market, is you can install it in any direction and you won't have the squirrels able to get an edge on that door and pull it open. Mm. Uh, we have, we have videos from some uh, guys that took videos in the field where the squirrels have messed with the door, trying to open it and everything. And the most any squirrel has been able to do is lift open the door, but because of the spring action on it, as soon as they try to do anything with it, to make their way back in, it closes before they can make it in. Nice. So this one is kind of born to be dummy proof because I ran into a bunch <laughs> of situations with one way doors in my area where either my technicians or other companies, technicians install the one way doors in all different types of ways. It just don't work. That's right. Gravity is not a one-way door's friend, but this, <laughs> but this one kind of kind of beats gravity when it comes to that. Right, right. I noticed and, the gauge wire you had on there was quite thick. Is that is that galvanized or is that just a heavier duty hardware cloth yeah, there this, for that? Yeah, this is galvanized steel. Galvanized steel. Okay. Yeah, and it, even um, even the door itself is a stainless steel door. Stainless so, steel door. Okay. Yeah, this is twenty gauge stainless steel door, so it can't be uh, can't be chewed up, can't be right. damaged. Wow. And with it being such a small door here, it's uh, it really takes a lot to uh, mess with that door. I mean, you you beat up the cage itself before the door ever gets bent or out of place. Right. Now, um, we also uh, have the bird one-way door eviction door okay now this one is designed with a uh plexiglass and there's no spring on it so kind of free uh free swing so this one unlike the other one you can't just install it anywhere you have to make sure right. that you know you work with gravity on this one but these yeah. are great they come with the uh the the screw tabs here so you can kind of install it right over top of a, a vent cover it the these things are clutch when it comes to uh bird season when we get into the spring and you get all all the birds flying into dryer vents bathroom vents and everything like that mm. you can simply take this door and place it over top leave it there for a day or so to make sure that any birds that would be deeper in the vent can get out and then come back do your clean out do your repair and, um, you know, this also works great for larger uh, birds, too. I've used them on pigeons. This is a, a, a four by four. Seems like it's a, a little tight, but pigeons can fit through there. If you have a larger, if you have a larger uh, uh, pigeon project, uh, say they're, it's a church and they're going in through a, a gable vent or something like that. Yeah. You can line a few of these up next to each other to give them multiple exits and they'll be able to pass through and they won't be able to get back in. And it makes short work for getting uh, birds out of structures. Birds out of it. Now, with uh, what's the smallest bird that can push that door? Is, can, can house sparrows push through that? Oh, absolutely. Okay. I mean, All right. if you, it, it oh. just, it just blows okay. open with All the right. wind because pretty much this will, so this bar right here, the shoe mm -hmm. bar that we install, yeah, it one it keeps the uh, the the door from going back too far. Right. But when they come to the front of the door, they naturally go and perch on the highest thing. So when ah. they sit sit right here and they go to the edge, naturally they're going to start pushing on that on that glass, and it just goes nice. up with ease. Nice. Okay, Sterling's. Okay. Now, is that 
So the four inch one way door that you use for your squirrels, do you have a larger version for rac for raccoons or do you just, or is that just for your squirrels? You don't, do you have mm -hmm. a one for raccoons? No, or we skunks? don't have one for raccoons yet. Okay. I mean, admittedly, I had to design for the raccoon one way doors. And then I was doing research and I found the rhino one way doors. Okay. And it was, pretty much exactly the way I plan to make it. So I had to tip my hat and say, you know, they got it first. Okay. And that raccoon one way door, uh, it's called the, the rhino. It's a hard plastic, uh, hard plastic door with a, um, uh, plastic housing. Okay. I had my doubts about it. I wanted to do one with metal, but I tried it out myself and they work great. I met the I met the developers of the product. They're great guys, and mm. it's it's a um, it's a good product. Okay. Uh, I have also used the Coon Troller from WCS. Okay, that's the pretty much been my bread and butter over the years, as far as using one way doors for raccoons. But they, you know, with all things, you have to sit there and and take it in, in account the pros and cons. Right. So. Right. The Rhino is is smaller, more compact, whereas the the Coon Troller it's a it's a beefier and heavier product, and you while it works great, and I've primarily used that in my career. You have to make sure that you set it up on a level base so that this way it's uh it's able to work properly because there's yeah. a two door mechanism on it. Okay. So the so is this so uh, you already have this big project ahead of you with the uh, getting bent academy that's coming up. Are you looking to is your like vision to expand this to in the future to be dealing with uh, having a course on one way door installation and the pros and cons of you know here's how here's when you use it here's when you don't use it um, if that's if that's a, an issue so then you would incorporate sort of another aspect so here's your repair work that you're going to do hardening the house and now you're installing the one-way door is that something that's going to be down the road baby steps baby, baby steps, steps. <laughs> yes okay yes so, so, yes. so it sounds I'm, like a I'm yes just, to me i i have i have am ambitions okay so that going good. in, in, in that right. direction but um right now we have the basic metal fabrication course yeah. and the next level is going to be called metal masters Metal Master. All right. So, so Metal Masters is obviously going to be our next uh, focus, where it's not as much of a standard class like uh, our Get Ben Academy uh, okay. basic courses, but it's going to be more of an event. And I'm working on it with uh, several different operators, and I'm not going to put myself on a pedestal here and say I'm yeah. the Metal Master of the industry. Right. Because I know there's many other uh, individuals in industry that have skills that I have yet to develop yet because they've been doing this a lot longer than I have. And the plan is, is to work with some of these metal masters to bring their skill set to the industry in an event where students can can come to our event after they've taken the, the basic course right. and then hone specific skills whereas uh doing metal work on crown molding or certain blending techniques yeah and um you know safety and protocols when it comes to working with these uh you know high uh high pitched rooftops okay. and you're you can do beautiful metal work but if you can't keep yourself safe right. on a 14 12 pitch roof yes you're you're in a world, of, world of trouble you know. of trouble yes yeah we don't we don't want to we don't want an osha incident uh and you and you don't want an osha incident when when you are the victim so without a doubt we've had pe we've lost people in our industry so it's um something we want to make sure we avoid without a doubt yeah wow well, you've got quite a lot on your plate here so let's we're wrapping up here let's just sort of highlight again 
getbentacademy.com. We can say that getbentacademy.com is online to sign up, to learn more, and to sign up for his uh, academy that's occurring February 3rd and 4th, 2024. That's the first one that he's offering in Houston, Texas at the Houston Elk Lodge. And he's also doing it again on February 10th through 11th, again, 2024, at the Houston Elk Lodge in Houston, Texas. So it's $900. If you have three or more individuals who are looking to take the class, he offers a break, a sliding scale break. So the more the more you send, the, I'm sure he'll work out a deal with you. You can contact him. But otherwise, you know, it's just a, an opportunity for you to get some important training to improve your skills, to serve service your clients in in the proper way that makes it look right and it's going to last and it's going to prevent future wildlife problems for them as well and something that you're going to be proud of as well so definitely check it out again getbentacademy.com mark prusidis is the owner of wildman mark enterprises llc based in philadelphia but check him out at wildmanproducts.com or getbentacademy.com. So I'm sure there's going to be something there for you to uh, for you to consider. Mark, we really want to thank you for coming on the show. We hope you enjoyed it, and uh, we're going Absolutely. to put some information. I'll put I'll put a Chiron on the on the screen for your website to help people. I'll be posting this pretty pretty quickly on my uh, Rumble account so that because people will. Uh, obviously, we're in a time crunch here now that we're already into January with the February event coming up here pretty soon so that we get, that can get posted pretty quickly. Thank you so much. And again, everyone, you've been listening to Living the Wildlife Podcast. We've been with Mark Presidis of Wildman Mark Enterprises. You can f- learn more about him at wildmanproducts.com and get bentacademy.com. We're glad to have you with us. If you need to have comments, criticisms, thoughts, you can send them to wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail dot com wildlife control consultant at gmail.com and you've been living listening to living the wildlife why because we want you to live the wildlife not be the wildlife take care everybody <laughs>